this is the third lecture now we're going to do uh, on, on, on in, a, in a class. We're focusing on concurrent control. And as I said in the, the lecture from the shack, we are focusing on transaction processing first because the idea there is that we want to see, uh, we, we, we want to ingest data and then be able to process it later on. So that's, so that's why we're focusing on the transactional side of things. Um, I do have one correction that I want to make from last class. So if you watched all the way through two hours of the lecture, uh, you, you would have seen the bit where I talked about um, isolation levels. And I made a mistake saying that the uh, original specification from, of the isolation levels in the SQL standard from 1992 was based entirely on, uh, on, uh, on the assumption that you're running a two-phase locking database management system. And so, and then, and then later on I said that there was this paper that came along called Critique of Anti-SQL -Isol Anti Isolation Levels that basically lays out the two different anomalies that we talked about, the cursor stability, uh, or the, 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 the loss update anomaly under cursor stability, and then the uh, right skew anomaly under SNAPS isolation. So, like I said, this is a very famous paper that came out in 1995. Well, the dude that actually wrote it sent me an email yesterday and said I was completely wrong. Um, and he's got this little bit here, though he says that the, the SQL standard wasn't actually written assuming that you're running under two-phase locking, right? It was, it was just written based on the, on the anomalies that we talked about. But then he talks about the guy that wrote the specification in the standard he gave this guy a early copy of what the spec was. He was too busy, didn't read it uh, thoroughly, and then the loss update anomaly ended up into the, the standard. And it's only later on when Microsoft was coming out with SQL Server and they were claiming that they were serializable, and he was like, no, 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 you're not serializable because you're susceptible to the loss update anomaly. Uh, then they, they finally got together with the guy that wrote the standard uh, and some other famous database people to actually write this paper and say this is why, you know, here's, here's all the issues with the, the, the standard. Um, so this little snippet here where he talks about the story of how this all happened, it's amazing because he starts like name dropping all these authors in here. Um, and some of, these, some of these you may not heard of, but like Pat O'Neill did like a lot of the early work on log structure merge trees. So if you know LevelDB, Cassandra, RocksDB, that's all based on his early work. Jim Gray won the Turing Award for databases in the 1990s. He invented two-phase locking when he was at IBM on System R. Phil Bernstein invented the first distributed database called, called SCD1 in like 1978 or something like that. So this email is amazing. This is like, um, you know, it's like, you know, if you're really into like uh, the and then you find the loss, uh, the chron uh, chronology of from or something like that, or if you're really into 50 Shades of Gray, whatever, right? Like, to me, this is amazing. And again, this is why I love the internet, right? We just put it on YouTube, and this random dude just sends me, no, no, here's what really happened. So I think it's amazing. And he watched all two hours of it. So um, <laughs> that was awesome. All right, so today's class, as I said, we're going to focus on in-memory multiverse concurrent control. So I'll go through what, I, what multiverse control is, but then we'll go through the actual design decisions, which, which was in the paper that you guys were assigned to read. Um, and again, the reason why we're focusing on this is because pretty much every modern database management system, whether it's actually in memory or on disk, that's been created in the last 10 years is using uh, some variant of MVCC. So it's worth for us to actually think about this and understand it better. So uh, multi-version concurrent control, if you take in the intro class uh, last semester, some of this will be review. Um, but the basic idea of it is that the, the database management system is going to maintain different physical versions for any single object in the database that gets modified. And I'm being vague here when I say object because, again, these, these, these protocols don't really care whether you're talking about tuples, single attributes, uh, tables, or you know, batches of tuples. I mean, our, for pur our purposes, we're going to focus on just some tuples, but the, 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 the more formal way is just to say an object in the database. So, so what the difference is between the physical and, and the logical is, like, You'll have a single logical record, like I insert a tuple into the, the student table with just your name. That's a logical record. But anytime I go and modify your information for your tuple, underneath the covers, the database system is going to maintain different physical versions. Right? And so, again, the way to think about this, anytime I, I do an update on, on a tuple, underneath the covers, it creates, it creates a new version for that. And how it actually creates it, where it actually stores it, that's all the things that we're, we're going to talk about today. So then what happens now, now that we have single, or, or, uh, for a single logical object, we have multiple physical versions. 
When I now do a query and say read that object, the database system has got to figure out what's the correct version that I need to see. And this is sort of what we're going to be focusing on in, in today and a lot uh, next class on how it's going to figure out, you know, for what, what timestamp should something be viewable to me and where to go find the record that I want or find the version that I want. So MVCC is old. MVCC was first proposed back in 1978 um, by a, a very famous dissertation done at MIT. Um, the first commercial implementation in actually a real database system was that done at DEC in early 1980s in a system called Interbase. Um, Later on, the guy that, that, that worked on Inter Interbase, which is called Jim Starkey, he went off then, tried to build a replacement for uh, InnoDB called Falcon for MySQL. That failed. Then he went off and built NeoDB, which is a, um, it's a new SQL startup out of Boston. So Interbase is really old. It actually still exists, but it sort of exists in two forms. Right? So DEC got bought by Compaq, but I think before then, they sold off Interbase to Borland, the compiler company, if, if you've ever heard of them. And then in, uh, Borland then open sourced it as Firebird, but there still is the commercial version of, of Interbase, which is now a, a, a mobile, uh, mobile phone database that's been, sort of been rebranded. Um, so it still exists. Firebird is probably the, the most like, up-to-date version that you would want to use. Um, if you ever wondered why Firefox is called Firefox, uh, it's when uh, Netscape went under, they went to open source the web browser, and they were going to call it Firebird, but they couldn't call it because of this database system existed. So then they had to rename it to, to Firefox, right? So and, so, and the key thing here is MVCC is going to be used in pretty much every single database system that's, that's been built that I know about in the last 10 years, with some minor exceptions. And so this is the way people build modern systems, so we should understand it uh, very carefully. So why use MVCC? What benefits to get? You know, why are people actually choosing to, to implement this? So the, the biggest benefit you're going to get is that the writers don't block readers. And readers, in some cases, don't block writers. But th this one's most important. So think of like in two-phase locking. right? If I want to write to an object and it's a single version system, I take the exclusive lock on that object. And now nobody else can, can get a share lock and read it. But if I actually don't need to see the latest version, if, if my transaction is running in the past uh, from, from your, your transaction right, in logical time, then I can read the older version and not interfere with you. Right? So, th so the way we're going to do that is that if we have transactions, if they're read-only or not, we can talk about what that means later in a second, um, every transaction will read a consistent snapshot of the database that existed at the time that transaction started. Right? Because you look to see, I know when I know my timestamp when I started. I know what versions of, of the, the 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 database for tuples should be visible to me, and the data system figures out which ones you, you actually can go see. The other advantage you can get for uh, MVCC is that you can support what are called time travel queries. So if you don't do any garbage collection, if you just keep all versions that ever existed in your database around, some systems allow you to write queries that say go get me this tuple as it existed two years ago, or go do a scan on this table as it existed five years ago or one week ago, right? So these are called time travel queries. Um, time travel queries are, are primarily only used, as far as I know, in like the financial industry, where you care about having the last seven years of, 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 of all the transactions on, in your bank for, for regulatory reasons. Um, most systems, as far as I know, most applications don't actually need this because it's sort of done at the application level. Uh, it's only really in the banks that I see people actually using the actual explicit feature under MVCC to do t uh, time travel queries. Um, yeah, a lot of systems claim they support this, but again, I, I, I haven't really seen a compelling reason of why, other than the banks, people want to do this. Um, this is not a new idea either. Some systems tell that, oh, look how great we are, we do time travel queries, look how novel we are. Postgres did this in the 1980s. Right? The first version of Postgres had time travel queries. Because all you do, you just don't implement garbage collection and you get it for free. Um, it wasn't until when Postgres actually started being used outside of academia, like in like 1998, 99, when they, when they forked it from the Berkeley version and added support for SQL, then they realized, oh, well, if you don't have garbage collection, you're going to run out of space really quickly. So they, they got rid of this. Um, so only recently, I think Postgres can get, uh, add, they added back support for explicit time travel queries. Right? It's a combination of turning off garbage collection and plus exposing some extra commands to you in SQL. So the key thing I hope you got out of the paper that I signed you guys to read uh, is that MVCC, despite concurrency control being in the name of, uh, of what we're talking about, uh, it's more than just a concurrency control protocol. 
right? If you want to support multi-versioning in your database system, it's going to affect the entire architecture of the system. And there's a bunch of design decisions we're going to have to deal with in order to actually implement this efficiently and correctly that we have to think about as we go along. So again, that's what the sort of focus is on today. Uh, but at a high level, you should be able to understand what's going on with, um, with snapshot isolation, because that's really important here. So again, snapshot isolation, what happens is when a transaction starts, it's going to have access or, or view a consistent snapshot of the database that existed at the time that it started. And so the key word that I'm, that I'm pointing out here is consistent. And that just means that there's the, in our snapshot for our transaction, even though there may be other transactions that are running the, to the moment that we started, and they may have modified the database, we will not see their changes because those transactions had not committed at the moment that our transaction started. So a consistent snapshot means we're only going to see changes from transactions that, that committed before we started. And when I say snapshot, I don't mean this in a physical sense, like I'm going to make a copy of the database, put it over here, and then do, you know, do lookups and make modifications to that. This is all done underneath the covers, and we try to do the, the minimal amount of copying as possible. Right, so we're not like literally making a copy of files and, or copies of blocks in memory. We're just using this version information that we're maintaining to say, what is the actual correct snapshot we should be seeing? Another way to describe uh, is saying that you're not going to see modifications from uncommitted transactions. These are called torn, torn writes. Right, so if, I, if my transaction updates two tuples, I should either see all of them or none of them. I, I don't want to see one, just one of them. Right, that would be a torn write. Now, under these snapshots, we'll see this as we go along. If two transactions try to update the same object at the same time, then the simple thing is we do is we just let the first writer win. The second guy will abort and will get rolled back. So with uh, MVCC, we're essentially going to get snapshot isolation for free. And free is in quotes because this is a bit of a tautology here, right? Because if you want to get snapshot isolation, you implement MVCC. If you implement MVCC, then you get snapshot isolation, right? So it's not like you 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 can do something different and, and, uh, with MVCC and get something. You know, and you, know, you could read uncommitted. You could do that. Right? But essentially, if you just follow the standard protocols that we'll talk about, you'll, you'll get snapshot isolation. Right? If you want serializable isolation, right, if you want to avoid phantoms or the right skew anomaly, then you have to do some extra stuff. And for this lecture and the paper you guys read, we're not doing that extra stuff except for the, the certifi certifier thing. We can ignore that for now. So next class, we'll see how we actually add back extra stuff, and I'll describe what the extra stuff is in order to get serializable isolation. So any questions about the high level what MVCC is and what snapshot isolation is? And again, I get excited when we talk about databases. Tell me to stop and slow down if I'm, if I'm going too fast, all right? All right, so what are the four design decisions we're going to focus on today? So there's the concurrential protocol, again, the, the coordination method we're going to use to keep track of what transactions allow to read what. Um, but then we're also going to uh, talk about how to do version storage, which, which turns out to be the most important thing, garbage collection and index management. So next class, we're going to focus more on modern implementations of the, of the concurrent protocol for MVCC. Then the class after that, we're going to go more detail how to do different types of garbage collection. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about version storage and index management beyond this course or beyond this lecture, but we'll focus it in it on today. So the paper I had you guys read. Uh, was actually something that came out of this course, right? Something that I wrote with with some students here. Um, I, I you know, I've done, I've, you know, I'm still kind of a new professor, but I've done enough papers now where I can start to, you know, pick favorites. Like you're not supposed to pick your favorite children if you have kids. You're not supposed to pick your favorite papers. This is actually one of my most favorite papers that uh, I've been involved in. I love it so much that when we submitted it to get reviewed at VLDB, we put the title of the paper as, this is the best paper ever on in-memory wallet divergent concurrent control. <laughs> and I believed it then, and I believe it now. Um, so the paper got great reviews. They, the reviewers really liked it, um, except that when we got back the comments, the very first thing that they wrote was, remove this is the best paper ever from the title and try to be more scientific, right? So that was sort of disappointing, but I could sort of see how they would say that, that you, know, you couldn't call your paper, this is the best paper ever. Um, so we came back with a second title. Um, if you only read one empirical evaluation paper on a memory control, control, make it this one, exclamation point. Um, so that didn't fly either. Uh, so they came back and said that this is subjective. Like you're, you're, you're assuming that people should only read yours. You can't do that. You have to be more about grounded in, in the facts about what the paper's trying to prove. So then the third title was, uh, we think you really enjoy this empirical value paper in memory, in memory multi-version control. So at this point, the paper got rejected 
And now they're, or sorry, it got accepted. And they were starting to get a little pissed off. And like the, the, the program chair was like, look, either you change the paper title or we're, we're rejecting it. Uh, and you know, I don't have tenure, so I needed this paper. The students needed the paper. So we ended up with the, the, bon <laughs> the boring one that you guys read. So this is the true paper. The true title is, this is the best paper ever, but it has to be referenced in, in the sort of correct term, so, or the correct title. All right, all right, so again, four design decisions. Concurrent control protocol, version storage, garbage collection, index managers. Let's start with the first one, concurrent control. So last class, I went sort of at a high level. I talked about three different concurrent control protocols, timestamp ordering, two-phase locking, and OCC, optimistic concurrent control. So, all those same protocols can then now be applied in a multi-version environment. And we can adapt them to work in an in-memory environment. So at a high level, they're going to work exactly the same. So if you understand how we did this on a single version system that we talked about last class, then you can understand how we're going to do this uh, somewhat easily in, in a multi-version environment. So I'm only going to focus on the timestamp ordering and two-phase locking uh, protocols. OCC is, is it's basically timestamp ordering. Um, but just with private workspaces. So the, the key thing I'll point out to you also is that in the thousand course during the BIS paper I had you guys read for, for the previous class, we talk about using MVCC. Well, we didn't label it as being MVCC, 2PL, or OCC, or timestamp ordering. We, for that one, we're actually following what was done in the original 1978 dissertation, which was MVCC with, with uh, timestamp ordering. But again, as we'll see when we talk about what real systems actually implemented, they're doing a combination of all of these things, right? So again, there's no one standard MVCC algorithm, even though systems will claim they use MVCC. Uh, you need to sort of drill down and understand which of these three they're actually doing. So we're gonna go through uh, the, the first one and the last one, but before we get into that, we wanna understand what we actually need to store in our tuple to keep track of the different versions. So unlike in a, um, in a disk-based system, and this, this will come up mostly when we talk about two-phase locking. Uh, in in disk-based systems, sometimes they'll store the metadata about tuples separately from the actual tuples themselves. So in two-phase locking, you have shared locks and, and, and exclusive locks. They will actually store those in a separate hash table that's separate from the, actual, from the actual data itself, the tuples itself, because they don't want the lock table to get flushed out or written out the disk when you run out of space if the tuple gets written out. But now in an in-memory database, the data is always going to be in memory, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. So we can actually get rid of some of these additional data structures and just inline the data about tuples, the metadata about the tuples, in the, with the tuple itself. Right? So in this case here, all our tuples are going to have some kind of unique transaction identifier. And in our purposes here for, for uh, MVCC, this is just some, you know, some timestamp. It can either be a physical timestamp, like a wall clock time, a, uh, a logical clock, like a counter, or physiological clock, which is a combination of, of wall clock time and, and a, a logical counter. Then we're gonna have our begin and end timestamp, and we're gonna use this under MVCC to figure out what the version lifetime is for this particular tuple. So we're gonna use this to figure out, for my transaction, does this particular physical version of a tuple exist in my consistent snapshot based on what my timestamp is. Then we're gonna have a pointer that's gonna point to either the next or previous tuple <coughs> Uh, in our version chain for a single logical tuple. So again, for every single logical tuple or logical record, I can have multiple physical versions, and I'm gonna use this as a, use this pointer field you know, as a 64-bit pointer to figure out where the next one I need to go if I'm traversing that chain. So we'll see this when we talk about version chains uh, in a second, but this is gonna be a, a single direction or singly, singly linked list. We're not gonna do double link because uh, in order to efficiently make modifications to the linked list. We want, we want one 64-bit field, so we can do compare and swap on that, all right? And then there's a bunch of additional metadata depending on the, uh, you know, what protocol we're using. We may have to store some extra crap in here. Again, it, it, it varies per protocol. So the one thing I like to point out here is that this doesn't really seem like a lot, but it is kind of relative to how big your tuple is, could, could be a lot, right? So I'm storing here, these are all 64-bit integers, right? We can ignore the additional metadata. So I'm storing four 8-byte integers per tuple. And so if I have a billion tuples, then just this metadata is going to be 32 gigabytes, right? So think about it too. If my data is a single, like, 16-bit integer, then I'm storing, uh, you know, 32 bytes per tuple to store just then 16 bits, 
right? So this overhead is, is not trivial, uh, but we have to do this, right? This is the classic trade-off between storage and, and compute in, in computer science. And we're, we're gonna see this all throughout the semester. So we could store some addition, you know, this thing separately and you know, do some clever tricks to actually reduce the amount of data we have to store uh, for e each individual tuple. Like we could like store, store these things as block headers instead of actually on a per tuple basis. There's a bunch of stuff we could do to alleviate or reduce this overhead, but then that would require more instructions or more computational power to process the data as we run transactions. And no system is going to make that trade off. They want, you want your transactions to run as quickly as possible, so we just pay the extra penalty of, of storing data like this. All right? And we'll focus on how to maybe compress the size of, of the, the actual data itself later on. All right, so let's look how to do multi version timestamp ordering. So the first thing to point out here is that, again, we have our transaction ID. And say in this particular instance here, there was some transaction at, at timestamp zero, or, uh, or sorry, at timestamp one that inserted these two, two tuples, A, A and B. And so for this column here, the version, this is just like for, for illustration purposes, this is actually not something you would actually store on, in the actual system. I'm just showing you that you know, there's, there's object A, object B, and here's version one for each of those guys. So we have the transaction ID, right? And then we're gonna use this to keep track of uh, whether a transaction is actively modifying our, our tuple. Um, so when it's zero, Means it means nobody's nobody's working on it. If it's some other number, then someone is, holds holds the latch on it. Then we have a begin end timestamp here. So again, some transaction that, that came before uh, and, 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 and inserted these two tuples had timestamp one. So the begin timestamp for these, each of these tuple is one, and then the end timestamp is infinity, and that means that this is the 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 newest version of these two particular tuples, and there's no other version that comes after it. Right, because infinity just goes forever. And then we'll have the read timestamp. We'll use that to keep track of just the, the, the timestamp of the last transaction that read this tuple. Right? And this is under the basic TO protocol. And we're going to use this to figure out uh, whether a transaction has come along as, as maybe as we're modifying this and maybe read a, you know, they're in the future and they read the old version and we're in the past logically and we're trying to write a new one and that, the, that the guy in the future would have missed. So we can use the read timestamp to, to check for that. All right, so the, say our transaction comes along, um, and it's running on one thread, and we're gonna assign it timestamp 10, right? So in the first operation, we wanna do a read on A. So we're gonna allow this transaction to read A if the uh, transaction ID is zero, meaning nobody holds the latch on it, and then our transaction ID is within the range defined by the begin and the end timestamp. So our timestamp is 10, begin is one, end is, is infinity, so 10 is, is in between that range. So therefore it's allowed to read that. So then we go ahead and update the read timestamp to say it's now 10, because we read it. So now we want to do a write on, on B, and so what's going to happen is if nobody holds the latch for this, this tuple, which again is defined by transaction ID if it's zero, then, and, and our timestamp ID is greater than the read timestamp, Again, nobody in the future has read our old version that before we, ins we install the, the, the one we're, we're trying to write now. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do a compare and swap on the transaction ID, set that to 10, because that's our timestamp ID, and then that essentially provides us, again, a, a latch in this entire tuple. So nobody else can read it and nobody else can, can write to it while we're doing this. Does everyone know what compare and swap is or no? Okay, cool. So then now I have, I can then now, uh, install my new version, and for this one, I set the uh, begin timestamp to be 10, because that's what mine is, my timestamp is, or my, my transaction ID. The end timestamp goes to infinity. Uh, I, I don't have to set the transaction ID to, 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 to 10 here, but because I'm, I'm implicitly getting the latch on this as well, because since nobody can read this because I'm latching it, they can't follow whatever the version pointer is to get to this next version, so they wouldn't be able to see it uh, either. So now, I go back to the, the older version, right, B1. I change this end timestamp to be 10, which is, which is what mine is. And then I do a compare and swap on each of these guys, set this to zero, and that releases the latches. And now the new version is installed. So is this clear? What's missing? Yeah, so go ahead. So in the read case, you don't grab the lock, the transaction lock. So his question is, uh, in the read case, do I not grab the lock? 
Uh, correct, yes. Because all you need to do is a, yeah, so his question is, do I need to acquire the latch on the object when I do the read? The answer is no, because if I go back here, right, yeah, so I do my read. I want to do my read. So all I need to do is uh, follow the version chain. I find that, th that this one is in, is in my range. I flip this to be 1, or to be to what my timestamp is 10. So now if another transaction comes along, and their timestamp is in the past, right? say that they have timestamp 5, they would come here, see that I read in the future, and they before they installed their update, and so they would have to abort because they wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed to do that. If a transaction comes along with timestamp 20, then who cares, right? Because because I've already I can still read this, right? So it's still all done tra transactionally and correct, correct. So any other questions? So at this point here, what's one big problem that that that's missing. What's one? What's one piece of information that we're we're not conveying in this? How do we know that the transaction committed? Right? Because there's nothing in here, right? Because because I stole my my timestamps. Anybody comes along and read this, but there's nothing in here that says, oh yeah, you this you just read a version created by by transaction ID ten. He committed. Yes, you're allowed to do that. So what's missing is this auxiliary data structure. Again, we'll see this next class when we talk about Hecaton and other systems. You need some other way. You need a global data structure to be able to say, yes, you're reading data from a transaction that committed. Or you need an extra field or some way to specially identify that, yes, the version you're reading is from a transaction that has committed. So one system, the way they do it is uh, they'll use an extra bit in this and say, this is installed by a transaction. And here's the time, it's always the same timestamp, but this is a timestamp because it's committed, this is a timestamp because it's still running. So you can, you can store that in there. But that doesn't solve all your problems. You still have, you still have to have a global, uh, some kind of global data structure to figure out what actually really happened to the transaction. All right, so let's look at two-phase locking. So we get rid of the read timestamp now, uh, and instead we're gonna have a read count. And the read count we're gonna use as a way to, to essentially be the shared lock, to keep track of how many transactions hold the share lock on, on the tuple we're trying to read. Um, and then we're now also going to use a combination of the transaction ID together with the read count to re represent the exclusive lock. So if the transaction ID is, is not set to zero, if it's something other than zero, then someone holds the exclusive lock for this tuple, right, while they're modifying. So let's look at an example. So I do, I want to do my read on A, same thing, I check the, uh, I check the transaction ID, see whether it's zero. If yes, then I, it, then I know nobody has exclusive lock. So then I do a compare and swap here to flip the, the read count to one. Now, in the paper, they talk about how if you want to actually be, have this done atomically with a single compare and swap, then this has to be 32 bits and this has to be 32 bits. Sorry, this has to, yeah, because it has to be together, it has to be 64 bits. So this assumes that you're allowing your transaction ID to be, be 32 bits, whereas in all the other uh, protocols we talked about, they're all 64 bits. I don't know whether in the newer versions of the Xeons, whether they have 128-bit uh, uh, compare and swap instructions. Uh, I probably should check that. But this, that's a, this is a minor detail, but like when you flip this one, you're also making sure that this is still zero. Right? And you want to do that with a single compare and swap, because otherwise you have to take a latch on the whole thing, which is expensive. All right, so this gives me the shared lock on this. I can do whatever read that, that I want to do. Now when I want to do my write on this, same thing. I'll do a, I'll check that both the read count and the transaction ID is zero, then do a compare and swap to set both of them, and now I hold the exclusive lock for this. All right, and then now I can go ahead and, and install whatever new version that I want. And when I commit, I go back, or yeah, flip that to be my timestamp, and then when I'm done, I just flip it all back to zero and then now it's been fully installed. So again, the big difference here is that we don't have a separate lock table. If you took the, the, the intro class last semester, you had to build a lock manager with these lock queues and do weights for a graph to figure out who's waiting for what. We have none of that, right? We have no global, global data structures to figure out who holds what locks, 
we just embed all of that now inside of our in our system. Now, if you want, if you this works great if you're doing deadlock prevention. If you want to do deadlock detection, then you do need a global data structure because then you now need to see who's waiting for what what lock to build that weights for a graph to figure out how to do cuts. And so if you're that's why most systems that are doing in memory multi version two phase locking they don't they do deadlock prevention not deadlock detection. Okay. So my comment here about the 32-bit integer transaction IDs is actually, uh, is actually an important problem. This wasn't covered in the paper. This is, this, this is just sort of something that we realized afterwards. Um, and that is that if you reach the max value for your timestamps that you're signing out to transactions, you're, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have problems. Because all sorts of weird shit starts to happen that you wouldn't expect. right? So let's say that I have a transaction here, and there are 32-bit integer uh, transaction IDs. So its transaction ID is 2 to 31 minus 1, the largest number you can have for unsigned 32-bit integer. And so I do a write on A. That's fine. Uh, so I flip now my transaction ID to be what my timestamp is. I update all my end timestamps and the new versions to now be correctly convey that you know, I've installed a new version that goes from 2 to 31 minus 1 to infinity. But now another transaction com comes along, and now we wrap around our transaction ID, and now we, we, we go to 1, right? Because it can't be 0 because we use that to denote that no one holds the latch or something. So we go to 1. But now I want to do a write on A, and now I got this weird situation where I've installed a new version um, that's valid from 1 to infinity, but my homeboy up here, he's valid from 2 to 31 minus 1 to 1, right? Which is not correct. All right? So wrap around causes all sorts of problems, right? It'll affect things like now rows that you thought were deleted now become visible. Uh, rows will get, end up reverting back to the state that they were before. Uh, this can mess up all sort of like, like referential integrity and foreign key constraints. Right? This is really bad if you allow something like this to happen, right? Just without doing some extra steps to prevent it. And so the way Postgres does it actually I think is the most sort of simple uh, and in some ways elegant way to handle this, and that they just have an additional flag in the, in the, the tuple header that, that denotes that a version is considered frozen. And so what that means is that if that bit is set, then no matter what timestamp you have when you do a comparison, that version you're looking at is always older than you. Right? So again, the issue here is that when, if I, did, if, say these two transactions are still running, this guy has trans transaction ID 1. This has 2 to 32 minus 1. Again, 1 is less than 2, two to the 30, two, 31 minus 1, but this transaction is newer. Right? It's in, in logical time, it should come before this one. But if we, just, if we wrap around, then we have that problem. So again, what Postgres does, it just says, I scan through all my tuples before I wrap around, and I set that frozen bit. And so now anytime I do a lookup and say, what version do I want? Is this version older than me or not? Or this, is this version within my snapshot? I use that to figure out whether something's visible to me or not. Right? And so the way they do this is that when they're getting close to wrapping around, the vacuum runs and it goes through and, and just flips that bit for everyone. And at some point when you wrap around, then again, every, everything's completely frozen. So you, if you look up like transaction wraparound problem in Postgres, like you'll see people talking like they, they turn off the vacuum for some reason and they start you know, getting up to that 2 to the 32 limit and then all of a sudden the system has to halt because now they got to go through everything manually and flip that frozen bit. So Postgres will do this in the background for you so it wouldn't really, shouldn't really be a problem. Um, but if, if you're not aggressively, if you have a lot of churn, you have a lot of versions, you, you could hit this. And this, again, setting the frozen bit makes all this problem uh, go away. So and now in our system, yes? Um, when you're running the vacuum, would you have to make sure that like, nobody's using the version that you're freezing? So the question is, when you're running the vacuum, you have to make sure that nobody's using the version that you're using. Um, yeah, so what you, you basically do is you just, um, you, know what the, you know what active transactions that exist, and so you know what transactions, what the, what the lower bound is for transaction IDs for, for anything that could be visible. So anything less than that, you can set the frozen bit. Um, anything that is at the cusp before you wrap around, 
It still handles it. If you have if you have open transactions when you wrap around, I think they have to stop and do some extra stuff. But if he does a bunch of old crap, then the frozen bit solves that problem. Yes. He says, "What if what happens twice in a row? What, what happens twice in a row?" If you have like a frozen, so you have, you have like frozen. Yes. Two to the power six to the minus one. Yes. You wrap around. Yes. And you get a new a new edge. And yeah. Why this old thing is still in the database? Yes. You reach the limit again. You just, you just wrap around again, right? Once it's marked frozen, it's always marked frozen. Yeah, but like how do you compare two frozen things in different intervals? So the question is, how do you compare two, ver two frozen things in different intervals? Again, you wouldn't do comparisons between, uh, you don't need to do comparisons between two, two version timestamps. It's like, I'm an active transaction, what, what versions can I see, right? And because you can also, you would also sort of derive the, um, the version chain would give you the, the chronological order as well, because you just have the pointers go from as, as they're added. Yes? How do you do time travel queries then? He, he, so his question is, how do you do time travel queries under this, in this environment? I don't, I don't think they actually support it under this. The way you could fix this would be an easy fix. Instead of having a bit, either frozen or not frozen, you just have like epochs. You have another counter to say, how many times have you wrapped around? And that would solve that problem. Yes? Uh, how to prevent the transaction from writing a tuple? Like, uh, if this tuple have been written by another transaction in the future? So his question is, how do you prevent one transaction from writing to a tuple that's been written by another so transaction? There's no read timestamp. Uh, under which one? Under uh, two-phase locking or, or which one? Two-phase locking. Oh, so a timestamp ordering. Right. Yeah. So, Sorry, almost there. Yeah. All right. All right, here. All right, so his question is, if this guy writes to this, this, this tuple, how do I prevent somebody else from coming that's in the past and writing to the same tuple or the future? Uh, if, if a transaction writes a tuple, and, but because there's no read time stamp, so he, he didn't know whether this tuple has been read by another transaction in the future. Now you do know that because that's what the begin and end time stamp give you. So his question is, I, say, say I'm here. I installed this update, right? I have B1, B2. B1 is, is from 1 to 10. This guy is from 10 to infinity. Now I have a transaction in the future. Say B15. He wants to, or sorry, timestamp 15, he wants to write to B. So what will happen is again, like I follow the version chain. I see that this is the latest version. Then I'll just go through the same process before where I flip that, flip that field. Now I hold the, the, the latch for it. I can install a new version and I'm fine, right? If now I'm in the past, say my timestamp is 5. Then I would come along, see B1 to B10. Oh, well, that means that there's another version that comes after timestamp 10 from a transaction that is in the future from me. Even though physically they got to it before I did, logically they're in the future. And therefore, my timestamp is less than this. I have to abort. First writer wins. I have to abort. I can't complete. But if, if another transaction already, uh, like uh, with timestamp 11, yes. has already uh, read B1, so the statement is, if, if a transaction comes along with timestamp 11, before we install B, B2, yeah. all right, so this point here, he comes along, his timestamp 11, he flips the read timestamp to 11, uh, right? And this is MVPO, but not two-phase locking? Yeah, so in two-phase locking, you have, you have the, the, the read counter. But read counter will be set to zero after the transaction commits. Yeah, but who cares? You, you commit and you're done. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, so I, and, and your question is, this is what I was saying, there's some, you need some global state to say, like, um, if I'm in the past, this transaction has, has committed, and it read something, uh, you may have to stall and wait for the reading transaction, for, for the writing transaction to finish before the reading transaction finishes. There's some extra metadata I'm, like, I'm, I'm being hand with you about, which we'll cover next class. All right, goddamn, I love transactions. Okay. Um, all right, so any questions about, about like any, like the timestamp ordering, two-phase locking, or the wraparound? Again, OCC, MV OCC is, is essentially very similar to, to uh, timestamp ordering. You just, you just do the validation at the end rather than as you go along under, under this, this scheme. Okay. So now we can talk about the version storage. So again, we're going to use the pointer field, the 64-bit pointer field in each tuple to build a 
latch-free version chain, uh, latch-free skip or uh, link list for all the versions that belong to a single logical tuple. Right? Again, what, what this is going to happen is this is going to allow us to be a quickly jump to find the version that we want for a particular tuple. Because we could just scan the entire table until we find what we want, but that's going to be stupid. We don't want to do that. Right? So we want to jump to what we know is the, the, the version chain for our logical tuple and then scan along the, the pointers until we find the version that we know that we want. So the indexes are always going to point to what we're calling, again, the head of the linked list, the head of the chain. Now, whether the head will be the oldest version or the newest version, that depends on how it's actually implemented. And you, you can go both ways. So one important thing also to point out, too, is that in order to get good performance, the, all these different versions that we're going to generate will be stored in what are called local memory regions or local memory pools for each thread. So don't think of this as like I'm going to malloc some, some giant block of memory, and then every thread can try to get, you know, get a slice of that. Every thread is going to do a malloc on, on, on its own local storage that's going to be close to where it's physically located. Right? If it, it'll be on the same, uh, in, a, in a NUMA system, it would be on the same DIMMs that are, that are local to your socket. And then that way, we can make new versions quickly without worrying about synchronizing on some global data structure. Again, that's going to be another reincurring theme throughout the entire semester. We don't want to do any global synchronization or the, the minimal amount of global synchronization because that's always going to be a bottleneck in a uh, highly parallel environment. So, of course, this now means that when I have to scan through and find my version chain, I may be jumping around to different memory pools and different sockets. But, again, depending on what your application or what your query is actually doing, if, if the head of the version chain is always the newest version, then you're really only going to jump maybe to one or two hops in the linked list. Right? You don't, you're not going to be you know, scanning a ton of data to fit, find the version that you want. So, the physically the memory region will be determine um, you know that's sort of like where actually in the hardware we're going to store our, our, our data. Up above inside our software, the different storage schemes will each determine where and what and where and what we're going to store for each particular version that we have to generate. So again, we'll we'll go through the the three examples one by one. So the the first example will be append only storage, and this is just where we create new versions that we add them to the tuple or to, to the table space. Uh, Time travel storage is a variant of this. We'll have essentially two tables, and we'll store old versions in, in one table. And then delta storage is where instead of storing complete copies of tuples, we'll just make uh, we'll just have like the diffs of the changes that we make. All right. So append only. This is the easiest way to implement multi-version concurrency tool, right? And so we have a single table space. Uh, again, think, think a lo single logical table. And we have all intermixed all the different versions, although underneath the covers, again, physically, the memory could be stored on, on different sockets or different NUMA regions. So what happens is every single time we do an update, we just make a copy of the tuple we're modifying to, to a new tuple slot inside our table and then apply a change there. So say our transaction wants to update A1 here. We'll make a new copy, A2, uh, with, our, with the new value when I write into it. And then we update the, uh, the pointer chain to now point to, to us here. Right, so think of this as like the head of the version chain in this case here is actually the oldest, A0. So if I want to get to A2, I have to follow from A0 to A1, A1 to A2 down there. All right. So that example is called oldest, oldest and newest. You can actually also go newest to oldest. And again, these are going to have different trade-offs in terms of performance, and it depends on what your application is, is actually doing. So if most of your applications are time travel queries, where you always want to say, find me the oldest version, always, then oldest and newest is obviously going to be faster because you don't have to scan the entire version chain to find the version that you want. Um, for a lot of applications, they'll have hotspots in the workload. Like the, most of the queries are going to access a small portion of the database or, or some subset of the tuples. So most of your tuples or logical tuples are not going to have very long version chains. But for the ones that are hot, if they're being updated all the time, then these version chains can get quite long. For newest to oldest, this will be faster if you want to always find the newest version to do lookups. But the downside is going to be that every single time you do an update, you're going to have to go change the, uh, the, the, all your indexes to now point to the new head of the version chain. On our oldest and newest, you only have to do this any single time you do garbage collection where you, you know, compact the version chain. In this case here, if you're always under, under append-only storage, if you're always adding new versions and that's, that's the head of the version chain, 
every single time I do an update, I have to update all my indexes to now point to my, my new version. And that can be really expensive, and we'll see in a second uh, how that's actually problematic for some, you know, a famous company. The next type of version storage you have is time travel storage. Again, the idea here is that we have our main table where we're going to have the master version, and this is going to be the, the latest version of our, of our tuple. And then we have some separate auxiliary table that's going to have the same schema, essentially the same layout as the, as the main table. But any single time we modify a tuple here, uh, we'll just append the old version over there. Right? So say I update A2, I'll make a copy of A2 into the time travel table, and then update the pointers to now point to uh, this new, new tuple here. Uh, and then I'll overwrite the master version to now be A3. And then I can update my, my pointer to now point to A2. So it goes A3, A2, A1. A1. So can I, think of, can I think of a really simple example or a really simple advantage of doing something like this over the, the single table? Yes? Perfect, yes. So he said that since this is always the latest version, it may not be committed yet, that's so, but it's just, you know, assume for now it is. Since this is always the latest version, when I do garbage collection, I could just blow this entire thing away, right? Assuming again, no, one, no one's actually actively scanning it, we'd be careful about that, but like, this just blows away. I don't have to scan anything here because this is always going to be the latest version. There's another obvious advantage as well. Yes? Boom, exactly, yes. Sequential scans are super easy because I just rip through this. I don't worry about following the version chain or checking the, the visibility. Or you still have to check the visibility. But I don't have to follow any pointers to figure out what version should actually be looking at. Right? So this is what SAP HANA does. Uh, and this is if you give Microsoft extra money when you get SQL Server and you support time travel queries, they, they, they set it up like this. Um, other than those two systems, I don't know of any, any other system that actually does this. Um, Right, so the one that is, in my opinion, the, the well, this is a spoiler, the, the better way to do this, and what we do now, is the delta storage. So the idea here is that we, can, we have our main table, and this will be the master version, the latest version that, of, of each uh, logical tuple. And then every time we do an update, we're going to store just a copy, uh, so we're store a delta record that only has the change that was made to the tuple. Right, so in this case here, if I'm, I'm going to update the value field, set that to 222. In my delta record, I just have a map that says, oh, I, up it, I updated the value attribute, and the old value was 111. Right? Do this again, right? And I, I update it again. I have another update here, and then right, I have a pointer down there. So what's an obvious advantage of this? Is that, it says if you're doing sparse updates and you're, storing, you're not storing a lot of data. This example here only has one field. Let's say I have a thousand fields, and my update query only updates one of them. In append only and time travel queries, I have to copy all 1,000 fields, even though I didn't update you know, 999 of them. In this case here, it's super simple. I just copy things, just copy the things that actually get modified. But now what's one downside of this? Re exactly, reconstruction. I may have to scan back farther and farther to find the right version that I want uh, to put the tuple back in the correct state. So like a pen-only storage, you could do or oldest to newest or newest to oldest. Oldest to newest actually doesn't make any sense because I, need, I may have to go back through the entire version chain to, to reconstruct the tuple. So anybody, anybody that does delta storage always does newest to oldest. So, th so this, the, you look into this thing, and it's always going to have the, the, the latest version. And I may need to go back to some point and reconstruct the tuple. So this is what Oracle does. This is what uh, uh, MySQL does. This is what, this is what m we do now. This is what Hyper does. Like, th th this, is pro this is the better way to do this. But it, it, it's more engineering work. And actually, you get the same advantage that he brought up before, too, for garbage collection, because I just blow this thing away. Like, I don't need to scan through this thing. I just say, all right, here's all my old versions in some table space or the delta storage. Let me, let me just drop that. So MySQL has really easy garbage collection, whereas Postgres, at least in the current version, has to do complete vacuuming because it has because it's doing a pen only storage, so it has to look at all the tuples. All right. So one additional thing uh, that you can you have to may have to deal with is 
how to handle non-inline attributes. So remember I said in the very beginning uh, that unlike in a disk-based system where on a single page we're going to, or, or a block of data for each tuple, we're going to try to store both the fixed length values or fields and the variable length fields all together. In an in-memory database, we're going to store the fixed length fields together in one data pool and then the variable length data in a separate pool, right? Because we, we can pack in the fixed length guys efficiently and jump to offsets without doing any, any you know, additional indirection lookups, whereas the variable length guys, we can store these in, you know, in, in, a, in a heap space somewhere else. So now the problem is that for all of these, if I am, uh, if I'm updating my tuple and not updating my, um, updating my, my variable length field, I end up making a bunch of copies for, for redundant data, right? So in this case here, I only updated the, the integer value, which is fixed length. Then I have my, here my string value is just a pointer. So I have to make a copy of my long string here so that this thing has its own pointer to, to the data as well, right? So what's one obvious way to fix this? What's that? Sorry. Okay. Reference counter, exactly. So I can, I can reuse the data I already have in my variable length field uh, uh, pool and have the tuples just point to the same thing if I have a reference counter to keep track of where they, uh, you know, who, who, how many times people are pointing at them. The problem is with this, though, is that now you can't move this, this memory, around, memory around very easily because I don't know who's pointing in the other direction. So if I want to move this, this piece of data in memory to, from one location to the next, I gotta scan through all my tables and say, or my, and see who's actually pointing to this. So we actually tried implementing this in our, the Peloton system uh, a few years ago, and it turns out we did something stupid where every block, of, every sort of fixed length block had its own variable length block, and so if we wanted to reuse pointers like this, we'd have to have pointers span blocks of data, and it became a big, big nightmare. So when we talk about dictionary compression, that sort of solves this problem automatically for us. So as far as I know, nobody actually does this. Our dictionary compression essentially does the same thing for you for free. Okay? All right, garbage collection. So again, just like you think in like, in like Java or other memory managed uh, uh, programming environments, we need to reclaim the, 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 the memory or the space we're, we're generating for these physical tuples over time, because otherwise we're gonna run out of space. So the two requirements we're gonna have that a physical version has to satisfy before we're allowed to reclaim it is that we have to say that no active transaction that's running can see that version of, of that tuple. And so I'm putting C in quotes here because it can scan it and see it, right? If it's following along the version chain, it may come across that particular old version, but it might, you know, it won't be in the timestamp range, so therefore it can't actually read it. So if, as long as no one can, no one can actually access that version, uh, in a logical sense, and if, uh, or if that version was created by an aborted transaction, which we, again, for aborted transaction, no one should see it anyway. So if we satisfy these two criteria, then we can reclaim the memory we're using for these physical versions, right? So there's a bunch of design decisions we have to deal with in, in to, to figure out how to, how to get these expired versions and expunge them. So how, how to look for them, how to decide whether it's safe to reclaim the memory, and where to actually look for the, the expired versions. So for this lecture, we're going to focus on this part. We'll discuss these parts when we talk about you know, the entire day on garbage collection uh, next, next week. So at a high level, there's two approaches. There's the tuple level and transaction level. So we're gonna focus mostly on, on the tuple level and we'll cover transaction level uh, in more detail later on. So basically for tuple level, what's gonna happen is we're gonna actually look at the physical versions themselves. We're gonna look at the data in, in the tables and decide whether we can reclaim them, whether we, we can garbage collect them. And so the process we can go about looking at them could either be with background vacuuming, so separate threads checking things, or what was called cooperative cleaning, where we have threads actually, as they scan the data and scan along the version chains, they find old versions and they, they go ahead and, <coughs> and delete them. In transaction level garbage collection, basically every transaction keeps a little, uh, some internal data structures and says these are the tuples that I saw, or these tuples that I modified, and created old versions for, and so then when it, they, they commit or abort, the garbage collector looks inside these data structures and figures out what it should remove. So let's go through the, the, the tuple level one the most. So again, so I have two threads here. 
T on thread one, we have transaction ID 12, thread two has transaction ID 25, and we have a really simple database here. So with background vacuuming, we're gonna have some separate threads that are gonna run periodically uh, and just scan through all the data and figure out what versions are actually still visible. So again, they will know what are my active transactions, what are their timestamps, so therefore what things are viewable. So again, it really is just a, a thread. We'll just do a sequential scan, look at, look at the begin and end timestamp, figure out which ones uh, uh, don't have no intersection with the, the intervals defined by the, the transactions timestamps, and go ahead and, and remove them. Right, it's the easiest thing to do. Just, just, just a sequential scan with an extra step of, of actually removing the physical versions. So this can actually get expensive, right? Because you may be going over data over and over again that you, that you shouldn't delete, right? Again, if you have a hotspot, only 10% of the database is being updated uh, by transactions, so therefore they'll have old versions. The, the rest of the 90% is actually not being modified at all. So you don't, it doesn't make sense to actually scan them. So you don't want to waste time doing this. So the way you can overcome this is to maintain essentially a simple bitmap. This, keep, this keeps track of whether any, uh, of what blocks of data have been modified since the last time you scanned through. So you skip any of the ones that, ha that have not been modified because you know you've already vacuumed them and you only look at the ones that, that have been modified. Right? Postgres does this, a bunch of other systems do this. It's, it's a pretty simple optimization. So now with cooperative cleaning, the way it works is that as transactions scan the version changes themselves, they, since they're, they're already checking to see whether something's visible to them or not, so they'll also check to see whether it's actually should be uh, garbage collected or not. So again, the transactions will know what are my active transactions, what, what are the range of, of timestamps that actually are still active or still in play. So now they do a look up through an index, they land into a version chain, and then as they scan along, again, if they see something that is not visible by any other active transaction, they go ahead and just, just delete them, right? And again, you, in this case here, we're doing uh, oldest to newest. So therefore, uh, you have to update the version chain, so update the index now to point to uh, the, newest, the new head of the version chain, right? What's one problem with this? Beautiful, awesome. So he said, if no one's touching the tuple, no, no, no one's ever doing a lookup, and, and that tuple has old versions, then no one's gonna come clean it, because no one's gonna scan it, right? So Microsoft calls these dusty corners, right? So if no one, say B0 and B1 are old versions, they should be removed, but no one ever does a lookup on B, then these guys are just hanging out forever. So the way you resolve this is that you actually do the background vacuuming every so often, just go through and prune out this stuff, right? So you sort of, you sort of still need both. All right, which, again, with transaction level garbage collection, the basic idea here is that uh, every transaction maintains a read-write set of the tuples, of the old tuples that they've generated. Uh, and then when they, they, they transactions commit or abort, the garbage collector maintains this internal uh, data structure. It says, here's all the tuples that I, that I, need to, I know I need to go clean up later on. Um, and then at some point when they know they're not visible, like it, it sort of pulls every so often, then it goes through and cleans things up. Question? No? Good, okay. Um, so with this one, in our experiments, we found that like if you have if your system is really fast and generating a lot of versions very quickly, you actually may need multiple threads uh, to run in parallel in the garbage collector to actually to clean things up fast enough. Because right? otherwise, if you can't if you can't reclaim memory faster than you actually are, are using it, creating new versions, then you, eventually you're going to run out of memory. Right? That's true actually for all of these cases. Um, I think this one is more more susceptible to it. All right. The last design decision is index management. So I sort of alluded to this already. I said that like, we're gonna have to have the index always point to the head of the virgin chain. So for the primary key, it always points to the head. How often we have to, uh, to update it depends on whether, how often we change the version head, right? It depends on how often we change the tuple and whether we're going oldest and newest or not. The, uh, if you update the primary key values, then the easiest way to treat this is just, instead of treating it as an update, you treat it by, by a delete, followed by an insert. Like if, if I have a primary key, and my, my primary key value is five, and I update it to four, rather than trying to maintain a version chain going from five to four, I'll just delete the first one and, and insert a new, new tuple. And so that has a new version chain. 
right? That makes your life way easier than try to be smart about how to keep, uh, to span different primary key uh, cross versions. Secondary indexes, though, are gonna be more complicated, right? So again, primary key is always pointing to the version chain. So if it's oldest and newest, uh, then every time we make a new version, we, we don't update it. If it's newest to oldest, then every time we do, every time we make an update, we do have to do it. For secondary indexes, it, it's harder because you may not want to point to the, the physical version because you could have way more secondary indexes than you could have for primary key indexes. Like for every table, it's only have one primary key index. For every secondary, you know, it could have multiple secondary indexes and, and you don't want to have to update all of them, potentially for every single time. So there's this great blog article uh, from Uber. This is 2016. And they come out and they talk about how that, uh, it's basically the story from how they switched from, uh, from Postgres to MySQL. The true story was they went from MySQL to Postgres back to MySQL because they hired some guy that really liked Postgres. So they switched from MySQL to Postgres the first time. And then the dude left and I'm like, wow, we're fucked. We got to figure something out. This is not working. So they went back to MySQL. So very expensive discovery for them. And they point out a bunch of different, a bunch of the different differences between how Postgres and MySQL manage versions in, in MVCC. But this figure here is actually what we're, we're going to talk about right now, how they're actually going to maintain their indexes. So again, the primary key index is always going to point to the head of the version chain, right, for a tuple. But the secondary key index could either point to the, the, the head of the version chain or point to something else. And MySQL points to something else, so that means every single time you update a tuple, you don't have to update the secondary indexes. Postgres always points to the head of the version chain, so that every single time you update a tuple, you have to update the indexes. And for Uber's particular environment they, or workload they were talking about in this example here, that, was, that became a real bottleneck for them. All right, so the two choices are logical pointers versus physical pointers. So with logical pointer, we're going to have some, uh, some placeholder value a unique value for our tuple that doesn't change across physical versions that we can use to identify it uniquely. And then we, we essentially need to then map what that logical ID is, this internal ID, to the actual physical pointer to get us to the head of the version chain. Right, and the two choices are our primary key or tuple ID. I'll explain what that is next, next slide. Physical pointers is what I said before, like what Postgres does. They always point to directly to in memory or, or the, the physical location of the head of the version chain. So if I'm doing new to oldest, every single time I create a new version, I pen that to my version chain, now it's the new head. If I'm doing physical pointers, I always have to update now the, the indexes, right? So I use this visualization to explain this, uh, these, these different concepts. So again, uh, say in our simple example, we're doing a pen only, newest to oldest. And for doing a lookup on the primary key, we go through the index, the index spits out a physical address that points us down directly here to the head of the version chain, right? That's fine. For a secondary index, say we do another lookup, if we, again, we have the physical pointer, then every single time this thing gets updated, we have to update that pointer. So for one index, who cares? But if you have a lot of secondary indexes, then this starts to get expensive because all these guys have pointers to the head of the version chain too. Right? And we'll talk about indexes in, in a few weeks. Like This is not cheap. To do probes in an index, especially if you're in memory, it's going to be expensive. It would be nicer if, there was, if you could minimize this overhead. The alternative is to have a, uh, use the primary key. So MySQL does this. So if you have a secondary index, the, the key is the key you're indexing on. The value is literally the primary key for that tuple. Right? If, my, if my primary key is an integer, then I'm just storing that integer as the value in my index. So then I take the primary key that's output from the secondary index, and I do my lookup at my primary key index, which is always going to be there because you have to have a primary key. Uh, or they have to meet. Logically, you don't. Physically, you do. Uh, you take the primary key index, then that gives you the physical address, and that finds the head of the version chain. Right? So this avoids that problem we had with the, the multiple secondary indexes, pointing to the physical address, because no matter, how, no matter how many times I change the head of the, of the version chain, I only update this. I don't update any of those guys because those guys have a logical, logical reference to something that this thing tracks. Right? Of course, now the downside is if my primary key is huge, then I'm fucked again because right? now I'm storing that entire primary key inside of my secondary index. Right? If my primary key is a, is a one kilobyte uh, string, then I'm duplicating that all over inside the secondary index, and that's going to suck. 
The uh, last alternative is to have some kind of indirection layer. So think of this as like a hash table where I have my logical tuple ID and that's like an internal reference or internal counter that I'm maintaining for every single tuple inside of this. So this thing spits out the tuple ID. I do a lookup in my, in my hash map or my hash table to say, give me the physical address. And then that points me here. So now if I update the version chain, if I update the head, I update my primary key index because they always have to do that. But then I just do this 01 lookup in here and update the, the hash table. All right? So again, the, for this one, again, depends on what your workload is, depends on what the application looks like, one approach might be better than another, right? If you have direct, if, you know, if you, if you have no secondary indexes, then who cares? If you have one secondary index, then maybe doing the lookup in the physical address, or having the physical address in the index is, is, is fine because you're not updating, you know, it's not, not that expensive to update one, but if you have thousands of indexes, then that's going to be problematic. All right. So any questions about any of these design decisions? Yes? So how much more expensive it is to do like two memory lookups? So this question is, uh, how, how much more expensive it is to do two memory lookups instead of one in the context of what? Is it worth it? Because I was... For, for like what? Like for like for physical address versus this thing, yeah. this is not a single memory address lookup. Like this is a hash table, right? So you got to hash it, then do a lookup, and depending on how the hash table is implemented, you may have to scan, right? This is not like I'm going to one load into to memory. And this is way more. Yes. So why is it hard to change from like newest to oldest to get away around? Let's say Postgres only use like oldest to newest, right? And then, can, why is it not like configurable? So his question is, why is it not configurable for, uh, for as like a DBA to say, oh, by default you're storing newest to oldest, but now go oldest to newest? Mm -hmm. That's a major en engineering uh, issue, right? Because think of all the other crap around the system that's make, making assumptions about how how these versions are stored, and what you know. As I scan along, I'm going to find. You know, the, the next thing I look at should be older than the one I just saw. That sort of trivial aspect of it permeates all throughout the entire system. It would be a major engineering overhead to do this. So no, as far as I know, no system does that. Yes? Um, is the table from tuple ID to address also considered as an index? So the question is, is the, the, the lookup table from the tuple ID to address also considered a index? Logically, yes. Physically, no. So this is invisible to the application. The application is going to be able to see this. right? You can't see this in SQL. Underneath the covers, this is where they're going to use this to, to route your, your tuple to the, where, the, where it actually is. right? So this is just an aspect of an, the internals of a database system that we need to make the system actually run, but it's not something that actually speeds up individual queries like an index does. So I wouldn't call this an index, but it's a hash table, so it sort of is, right? Yes. All right, so his statement was, th we're only using this to solve the problem of the indirection from the secondary index to the physical address. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you delete, when garbage collects a tuple, why not just copy the next one to it and then change the pointer so that you don't have to change the physical address? So his question is, when I do garbage collection, uh, say, say I'm garbage collecting this, right? Or sorry, A4. Why not copy A2 to A4 and then change the pointer to A1? All right, so he says, why not copy, say I'm garbage collecting A4. This, this, this is newest to oldest, assuming it's going the other direction. I'm, this is the oldest, and I want to garbage collect this. Yeah. So instead of blowing this away and updating this pointer now to point to A3, what if I copy A3 over here yeah. and, then change the pointer. and change the pointer to this to now point to this? So that requires updating two memory locations, and therefore you need a you need a latch, right? Like to to update this the linked list, that's a single parent swap. I can guarantee that's done atomically without having to take uh, a heavyweight latch. 
to do what you're doing, to copy things over here, how do I make sure that nobody else is trying to do the same thing I'm doing at the same time? Right? Because if I'm copying all this data, think about this. I c so let's break it down. Again, I should explain. Well, this will we'll, this will come up more and more when we talk about like lat tree indexes and things like that. But th let's walk through the steps you described. So we're going to take a three, copy it over to top of a four, and update this pointer now to point to a two. All right. So let's say I do the update the pointer first. Right. I update the pointer a four now to point to a a two. Someone comes along looking for a three. They can't see it because this 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 link isn't there anymore. All right. Now I copy a3 over before I update the link. So I copy a3 over, but then now someone comes along and scans this and they'll see a3 twice. So basically you can't atomically can update two memory locations in a way you're describing without taking a latch. And we want to do this, we want to do this uh, latch free. Yeah, and another question. Uh, when you talk about link to this, link to this, do you mean a traditional link to this or a link to this? Injected into a large trunk of contiguous memory. His question is: When I say linked list, do I mean a traditional linked list? Which we have to define what that is, uh, so or or a, a linked list? Every node is just metal uh, in a heap, or you just metal belong to a large trunk of memory. And All right, yeah, I know what you're asking. All right, so his question is: Am I describing this this version chain as a linked list? Am I describing that as like I'm malloking a bunch of nodes and I'm linking them all together, or do I malloc a bunch of crap ahead of time and just reuse the memory to then point to different parts? Yeah. It's the second one, because remember I said in the beginning, every thread's gonna malloc some thread local storage. And that way, when they wanna say, I need a slot to store a version, they don't have to go to a global data structure and get it, they just get it from their local memory. They don't need to synchronize. So yeah, so it's exactly what you're saying. You're, you're, you're mallocing a big chunk of memory and you're slicing it up to maintain these versions. But we're doing that on a per thread basis. Okay, awesome. Good questions. All right, so the paper, how do you guys read? Again, the, the best paper ever. Uh, again, this came out of this course, right? So as I was teaching, I think it was 2016, I think the first time I taught the course, I was like, oh, well, there's all these questions about MVCC. And when this came out when we were building the Peloton system, we were like, oh, how should we do this? How should we do this? How should, you know, how should we make these different design decisions? And when you go read the papers we'll, we'll see next class, they talk about the concurrency protocol and they talk about how they do all these four different things, but they don't say why they do it. They don't, they don't evaluate other options. They say, this is the way we did it. And so this paper, the idea was the, we're gonna take all these different techniques from all these different papers, build into our single system, run a complete bake off on all of them, figure out whatever, which one turns out to be the best. And that's what we end up picking, picking and using, right? So uh, these are actually the students actually in this class, uh, this is actually on the final exam day when we do the, the final presentations. And, and so the prize they got was uh, the anime textbook for databases and then uh, the, my fake autographed copy of Larry Ellison's unauthorized bi biography. Um, with the, difference between God, the difference between God and Larry Ellison is that uh, God doesn't think he's Larry Ellison. Anyway, Larry Ellison is the, uh, the founder and CEO of Oracle. The, I can't talk about him on video because the MySQL guys complained that I talk about Larry Ellison too much and that when they watch these class videos, uh, they, they, they want to share them throughout the company, but I say too much crap about Larry Ellison, so <laughs> they can't do that. Okay. All right. So the first part was, again, we, we, we sort of isolated each of the different design decisions, did a bake off of them, and see which ones actually turn out to be the best, right, within just you know, making that one decision. So for the concurrent zero protocol, I would say the results are inconclusive, right? Some protocols work better than others for different, different workloads. And this would be not just for MVCC, pretty much any, you know, even for single version systems or even distributed databases. There's no one protocol that is so much better than everyone else, right? There's, they have different trade-offs. There's other aspects of the implementation that actually end up mattering more. For version storage, uh, we turn out the deltas work the best, right? Because again, you're, you're not, you're minimizing the amount of data you have to copy every single time you update a tuple because you're only copying the subset of the attributes that modify. Tuple level vacuuming turns out to be the best. Um, I think cooperative is actually slightly easier to engineer, but it's, it was, um, this was slightly better. And then no surprise, logical pointers is much better than the physical pointers for, you know, for workloads that look like the Uber environment. So 
what was really disappointing about this paper was uh, we did all this, and then we said, all right, well, let's go put this in Peloton. These are the best ones we did. And then we didn't end up actually doing that. We ended up picking like the worst things, which is why we had to throw away, the code, throw away all the code. All right, so this is the table that just summarizes what these different systems actually implement. Um, and so MySQL, Postgres, and Oracle, these are not in-memory systems. We're showing them for historical reasons. Obviously, they're, they're very popular and widely used. Everything down here are all uh, uh, in-memory systems. And so the main thing to point out is, again, everyone's doing all different things. And sometimes they're for performance reasons, like, like for a particular workload they were trying to optimize for, that they picked you know, certain design decisions. And sometimes it just came down to be engineering. We asked them why they did something that said this just the way the dude that wrote it wrote it, right? Um, for our new system, right, the name to be determined, please do not call it tier B. We're not calling that. That's the name of my dog. We had to put something on the, the GitHub repo. So we put that. We're going to rename it, but don't call it tier B. So in the old version of Peloton, we were actually doing uh, MV2.0, append only, vacuuming, and then I think logical pointers, but these really kind of nasty ones. In our newer version, we actually went back to Hyper and actually copied a lot of the, the ideas that they did, right? Because when you do the Bake Off and look at how they all perform, right, at the very top here, you have Oracle, NuoDB, MySQL, and Hyper, right? So these guys are all doing Delta storage. They vary on the, uh, the, the concurrency protocol that they're using, but they're doing the background vacuuming and then the logical pointers, right? So this is running TBCC with some extra uh, additional scan queries. Right, uh, Postgres actually ends up being the worst, followed by Hackathon and so forth. Right, so again, the way to think about it is at, over here at 40 cores this is the max amount of parallelism we, we're trying to achieve on, on our box inside the system for this workload, and it turns out the delta storage stuff actually end up mattering the most in this environment because again, you're just reducing the, me the memory pressure in the system. So. I'm not saying because of these results, but uh, Postgres announced, or, or uh, they, somebody that works at you know, a, you know, pro, a high level project committer on the Postgres team announced last year that they were exploring the idea of dropping the, uh, the append only storage that they're using and switching over to the Delta storage. It has a name, I, this is all very experimental, um, but they talk about how if, if they switch to Delta storage, then they don't have to do any more vacuuming because they just look in the rollback segment or the Delta storage parts and you find all the old versions to delete. So Postgres is moving in this direction uh, with Delta storage and I think that's the right way to go. Okay? All right, what are my parting thoughts? Uh, MVCC is the best approach to support mixed, mixed workloads, which is the focus on the semester. We wanna do transactions, we wanna do analytics on the same database instance. Having multiple versions around make our lives easier, right? Because we can have these read-only transactions, read-only queries, go read old versions without interfering with, with the updates. Um, primarily, in, in this class, though, we only focused on uh, for OSP environments. But the, the Delta Shore stuff, as we'll see next class uh, in under Hyper, is actually still really good. There's some extra stuff you have to do to make them go, make the analytical queries run faster. And we'll see how they, they handle that next time. OK? All right, next class, we're going to go into more details about you know, real world implementations of in-memory MVCC. You guys are assigned to read the Hyper paper, which is our system is based on. We'll also cover Cicada, which came out of CMU, Microsoft Hackathon, and if you have time, MemSQL. Okay? All right, guys, any questions? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.